the other thing about Slido is if you look at the Slido, you can vote for the questions you want us to take. So on my screen, the ones that get the most votes come on the top, so it's easiest to see. But anyway, we shall kick off. Uh, welcome to this latest uh, UK of Changing Europe Unlocked. Our guest tonight is Ros Atkins, who will be familiar to all of you from the BBC. Uh, partly through open source, partly I think mainly nowadays through his wonderful explainer videos that go viral every time he does one on social media. Uh, Roz is a founder of the 5050 Project, which aims to increase the representation of women in media content. Uh, and he has, as you will notice in that corner there, recently written an interesting, very interesting book called The Art of Explanation, which we're going to spend a bit of time uh, talking about, and you can buy a copy of it afterwards. You might even sign it, might you? I'd be delighted to. Excellent. Well, Roz, well, you he also is a drum and bass DJ. I don't know what that means, but it sounds quite good. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, thanks very much for having me. Thanks for everyone for coming out. Appreciate it. Can, we just get, can you just talk us through the book, basically? What it is and why you wrote it to get us started? Yeah, by all means. So, the book's called The Art of Explanation, and it's essentially me trying to outline the techniques that I use as a journalist and broadcaster to explain what I do to try and assemble the most relevant information on the subject I'm trying to communicate on, and then put that information in a form that gives it the best chance of being understood by whoever I'm reaching. And one of the reasons I wrote the book was that it seemed to me as I was going through my career and I was observing not just how I was doing stories, but also how I was trying to get ideas off the ground or how I was trying to make the case for certain changes, hmm. was that some of these techniques that I was using in the studio I was actually using in lots of other areas of my working life and actually areas outside of my work too, like going to the doctor or other examples. And it seemed to me that those techniques could be helpful and useful and of interest to anyone who's interested in communicating more effectively, which I was making a calculation was probably most of us. And so the book's my effort to put those techniques down in a way that people can hopefully understand and use. I mean, I have to say, one of the reasons I was really keen to do this event was because what you do is what we aspire to do, which is to take stuff that's very, very complicated and try and make it accessible to people. I mean, you have one massive advantage over me is you don't work with academic lawyers, uh, <laughs> at which point communicating clearly <laughs> becomes something of a struggle. But anyway, so one of the really yeah. interesting things you say, I mean, just, just to dig into this a bit, one of the things you say is to explain is to first understand. Does this mean that yeah. you, so behind every video or behind every news clip, there's an awful amount of swatting goes on? There's a huge amount. Yeah. There's a huge yeah. amount of work yeah. in any... Uh, any of the videos that people may have seen. And in fact, you know, it's lovely coming back here because I was a news presenter here on the, on the World Service in Bush House for many years. And that was really my first regular job as a news presenter. And I was a generalist then and I'm a generalist now. So every day when I come to work, I may be talking about one subject or another. And even though, of course, I consume lots of news by most standards, and I'd like to think that I can bring a reasonable amount of knowledge to most of the big issues that are playing out in our world, I'm not someone who concentrates on one dimension of the news. And as such, you can't hope to explain something effectively doing the job that I do without acknowledging there are going to be limits to your knowledge. And being frank with myself about what I don't understand is absolutely central to communicating effectively. So I'll be constantly saying, well, why is it like this? And why haven't we mentioned that? And do we need to include that? And I don't understand this. And, and the process of acknowledging the limits of my expertise is useful for two things. In the, in the process of doing that, I, of course, become better informed, and that means I can make better judgments about what to include and what not to include. But it also helps me sharpen up my confidence on the subject. And one of the things that I try and get across in the book is that that process of acknowledging what you're not sure about on a subject and addressing it is helpful whether you end up using that information or not. Because, say, okay. you're in a job interview, you don't want to be sitting there thinking, this is going to be fine as long as that subject doesn't come up. You want to know if that subject comes up, actually, you've, you've, yeah. looked, you've looked that problem in the eye. Can I just say to the sound people, we're getting an awful lot of things on Slido saying the sound is garbled. Uh, I don't know if there's anything you can do about that, but you know now at least. Have you, have you ever come across something and thought, actually, I can't do that? Like, you know, we've sometimes had blogs on our website which we've desperately said, can you explain X, and it's been quite complicated, usually economics or law, 
not that I've got a problem with economics of the law. And it just turned out that there was no way of doing it that clearly, that access, because it was actually turned out. I mean, some things are just are too complicated. No, I don't think I, I don't think I would accept that. I think okay. you can explain very, very complicated subjects. They just take an awfully long time to get to a point where you can communicate them right. simply and consumably. So there'll be some subjects that we can take on on the day and we'll produce a video by the end of the day, which we feel does a really good job of explaining this in a comprehensive but consumable way. There'll be other subjects where we will spend days and days and days, come, sometimes just coming again and again at one particular aspect of it. And I would say there are two things which help me do that or get to a point where I feel like uh, I'm being clear. One is simply to accept these things aren't always quick to do. Accept that communicating clearly sometimes just is work and don't, mm -hmm. and don't fight that. And the second thing is get help. Like explaining really complicated things is tough. It's even tougher on your own. And so quite often I'll come up with a phrase or a paragraph or a part of a video and, and then we'll take it to someone who maybe does know the subject well, but equally maybe doesn't know the subject well and say, does this, does this make sense to you? And they might say yes, in which case, great. Or they might say, actually, I was fine up to this point. And we'll go, okay, that's the problem area, that sentence, the bit before, and we'll do some more work on that sentence and then we'll share it some more. And so there are lots of ways that you can get other people to help you spot the points in your explanation where you are losing people. But for me, it's about time investment. And in the end, if you put in the time, you'll, yeah. you'll get there. I mean, I must admit, I read the book and part of me was thinking, bloody hell, no one is that organised. Because, you know, you have this, this seven-step process. Yeah. Uh, and, I mean, I wish I used the seven-step process. But, in, I mean, do you, do you routine... Well, firstly, talk us through what the seven-step process is, and then we can talk about what... So, essentially, my calculation around communication is that almost always communicating really effectively and with impact and with clarity and calculating what you're saying to match the people you're trying to reach and the circumstances in which they're consuming is really hard, especially on complicated subjects. And mm -hmm. to reiterate the point I was making before, it's a good thing to just acknowledge that it could be quite hard and that you're probably not going to be able to just go, let's do it. Yeah. And so, as such, I try not to get overwhelmed by the kind of the scale of the task in front of me. And so I have a series of steps that I go through, and we can maybe talk about it later, but it started being at university facing very difficult history essays and just thinking, this doesn't look viable. But essentially, the, the steps go from the, I'll do it very quickly, but the first one is what I call the setup, where you just pause and say, what am I trying to do here? And I might do this if I was going to the doctors just outside the, in the waiting room thinking, okay, what am I trying to say here? Or in a big meeting with a boss or making an explainer video or lots of things. Just pause and say, what am I trying to, what's the purpose of this? Who's it for? What's the circumstances? Just so you know what you're doing. Yeah. And when you're clear on that, all the decisions you make about the information you include and don't include are guided by those. So you're making better, smarter decisions that are working towards what you're trying to achieve. Once I've got that, step two would be to gather the information. I don't worry too much about what form it's in. I just go hunting for the information that I think matches the purpose. Step three would be to distill that information because one of the things that gets in the way of us communicating clearly is the actual pieces of information are often not in the most consumable form they could be. Yeah. So I kind of distill them down, polish them, if you like, until they're in their simplest form. Once I've done that, I'll then think about organizing the information putting it in some form of structure that makes sense. And only at that point will I think about linking it. Will I actually start constructing sentences or thinking about the language I want to use? So I actually would get to the point of writing something or practicing saying something out loud quite late in the process. Mm -hmm. So we've rattled through, those are five stages. The sixth one is what I call tightening. We always in our, almost always in our first go at communicating something, will fill what we're saying with unnecessary words, phrases, and information. And one of the things that I noticed, and it came from a colleague, Alan Little, and when he pointed it out, it was like a kind of gut punch, really. Alan talks about obstacles to, he calls them obstacles to comprehension, I call them obstacles to understanding. But his point was, within what we're doing, we're putting all of these things that actually get in the way of our audience understanding what we're trying to say. And so once I realized that, I was like, hold on, in the very act of communicating, I'm putting stuff in there that's yeah. undermining the purpose of what I'm doing. So tightening for me, stripping all of that out is hugely important. And then the final point is to rehearse what you're doing. So whether it's written or spoken, 
I would never not go back over it. So if I'm writing a script for one of my videos, I've probably read it out 10, 15, 20 times before you eventually see it, even if I've written a book. Every word in that book has been written, spoken out loud multiple times because I find the process of going back over and rehearsing and verbalizing is very, very effective at flushing out inconsistencies in what I'm saying. And I appreciate that might, you're kind of listening to that thinking, that sounds like an awful lot. But actually, a lot of what I've put in the book just becomes habit. You're not going, right, stop, I must go immediately through the seven steps. I mean, sometimes I would quite, quite systematically. Yeah. But a lot of this becomes instinct. But the general message is, don't try and do it all in one, one go. It's like building a house. You've got to lay the foundations, then you've got to build the ground floor, then you've got to build the second, you know, and you build up and then you can put a roof on it. But what's one of the things that's fascinating about the book is you say, you, you know, the, these are lessons for everyday life as well as for work. So this yeah. isn't just about Definitely. explainer videos. This no, is not about, at all. Because you talk, you know, there's some really interesting things there about job interviews, good and bad. Yeah. Uh, and so you, you're, the claim in the book is that this actually helps you be more effective throughout your life rather than just at work. Yeah, I'd, I'd make that claim with great confidence because I think, and we could all think, right? Let's just think about the last few days. We can all think of examples where people or companies or organizations have been communicating with us and it's not the information we've been looking for from those people or that organization has been hard to get, hmm. right? And in those situations, two things happen. One is we give up or the other is that we have to put in loads of time to find it and we, that doesn't feel good and the chance of us responding positively goes down. So, or more positively, we can think of examples where people have done it very effectively, and you think, well, okay, that makes it easier for me to make a judgment on what you've told me. And actually, what I'm talking about is reasonably fundamental, because running through the fabric of all of our working lives, certainly, but maybe other aspects of our lives, too, is the simple equation of, I've got some information to pass on, how can I do it most effectively to the people it's for in the circumstances where it's going to happen? And that calculation, once you start approaching it consciously, can be yeah. really quite transformative. And again, to, to emphasize, I don't mean sitting down for half an hour every time you go into a five minute meeting. If I have a meeting at work, and my colleagues will have seen me doing this lots of times, if I don't have anything on me, I grab any piece of paper and I'll do three columns and it'll be, what's the information I wanna get across? What's the information I'd like from whoever I'm meeting? And what's the action I'm hoping will come from the meeting? doesn't mean those things are going to happen, but by just quickly, consciously thinking about it, it gives you a better chance. And I mean, one of the differences, I suppose, between your world and mine is you spend a lot of time talking about the audience. Yeah. You have an audience. I mean, you work for the BBC. But we all, so when you say I, take into account your audience... But I would so say we all have audiences. When you send an email, whether it's to one person or 20, that's the audience. If you go into a... No one reads my emails. <laughs> well... That's a separate, there's a challenge, right? But I suppose that- I blame the audience at that point. <laughs> uh, but I suppose in any situation, when we're communicating, there is an audience for the information that we're passing on. Yeah. Uh, we might not think about uh, the nurse who's looking after us in hospital as the audience, or we might not think of the teachers at our kids' secondary school as the audience, or we might not think about a potential client as, a, as, a, as an audience, but they are an audience in a form. And the more that we can think about what's the best way of me giving this information to those people, the better it is that our information is understood. And the reason I feel quite passionate about this is actually roots to a story here in Bush House. So when I was starting out as a news presenter, I used to do nine till nine overnight. So I used to emerge 9 a.m. in the morning and go and get the bus from behind Bush House home to South London. And I came out of the studio in uh, Southeast Wing, which is over there, I think, um, one morning, and I was a bit, it was a bit kind of unsettled, and I thought, why am I not feeling good about the show I've just done? It was factually correct, it was well produced, of course, by the sound engineers and the producers, there's nothing kind of on the face of it wrong. But I knew that I'd really totally failed to make this story comprehensible. It was a complex story and I'd failed to get it across. And on quite a fundamental level, I thought, well, if you've gone to all the work of researching this and of setting up the guests and of mm. producing all the clips and of the sound engineers doing their job and everyone else kept their part of the bargain, but my part of the bargain was taking all of that and passing it on to the listener in Australia or the US or Kenya or wherever they were, and I felt like I, I hadn't. And for me, explanation is about the substance, the information you want to pass on, but the style, how you're passing that on. And I think we sometimes neglect the second part of the equation but if we do, there's a risk we've got the good stuff that we want to pass on, but it never reaches the people we hope it will reach. And you think about it in those terms, and suddenly it feels pretty important. 
And do you not do what, I mean, this is what I do. You just have a person in mind. I mean, I, I write for my mum. So in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, will she be able to read this? I mean... Sometimes, but I suppose different, you, different people have different levels of knowledge, different interests, different ways they prefer to receive information. I've got colleagues at work who I would definitely not send a long email to because I just don't think they're the type who's going to go through it, but they do respond well to quick conversations. So I might set up a quick conversation. I've got other colleagues who, are, who like as a kind of to go through written briefings, so I might write a, a short written briefing for them because they prefer that to lots of meetings being set up. So I do think that according to who you're communicating with, you need to calibrate what you're saying. You're right, right there's no harm in having someone in your mind and, and your mum is an excellent choice, but I do think that say the information that we need to include, if I were writing about my work at the BBC to someone outside the BBC who knew nothing of it, then I would obviously need to include stuff that I wouldn't include if I was writing to a close colleague. Yeah. And so yeah. I do think bearing in mind who you're talking to at all times is really helpful at deciding what to include and what not to include, which is one of the most crucial decisions we all, yeah. we all yeah. make. There's a really interesting phrase in the book where you say it is very important to sound like yourself yeah, I think when so. you speak. What, can you talk us through what you mean by that? I think that on the whole, when people are communicating with us, we prefer being communicated with by people who are being authentic. I mm -hmm. think if people are communicating and we believe in the person who's talking to us, then of course that's going to affect how we receive the information from them. And one of the best ways of being, of coming across as trustworthy and authentic is speaking in a way that you are clearly comfortable with, in a way that matches who you are. So as my long-suffering producers at work will tell you, I have a non-negotiable rule that I won't read a script on air unless it's how I would speak. And so even if I would come and the producers have written a brilliant series of scripts for a number of stories I'm doing on the TV, nothing factually wrong with them, nothing grammatically wrong with them, nothing wrong with them, I would still rewrite all of those scripts because inevitably there'll be some turns of phrase that don't quite match mine. It's not a criticism of them. It's just that for me to speak on the TV and for you to feel like, okay, this is this, this, is this guy talking to me as he would, I need to go back through them and make sure that I would actually speak like that. And so that's a really powerful question I always ask myself, whether it's emails, whether it's a book. I mean, I've, a, lot, a number of people who know me who have looked at the book have very kindly said, like, as I'm reading it, I'm hearing your voice. Yeah. And for better or for worse, I hope that comes through. And I also hope that for better or for worse, those of you here who've seen any of my videos or watched or listened to me are not seeing a massive difference between me here and, and the person that you, that you see on BBC News. And it all connects to my belief. And I don't believe anyone needs to trade in who they are or how they speak to, have, to communicate effectively. On the contrary, I think we communicate with confidence and with purpose when we, we are communicating using language and phrases and words that fit with who we are. And does that sort of interact with what you said about audience? That if you're doing something for Radio 4, would you do it differently if you're doing it on Radio 5? Or? I think the way I put it in the book is that we all communicate in slightly different ways according to situations. If I was sitting around a kitchen table this evening with my kids, I would be using a slightly different tone to the one I'm using with you now. Uh, if I'm Good. in the pub with my mates, I'm going to be talking a little bit differently to if I'm on Radio 4 or yeah. whatever the example is. Now, all of those are still authentic to me. It's just we all calibrate how we are according to the circumstances that we're in. Yeah. So that, of course, carry on doing. I'm just saying that in all of these situations you find yourself in, don't feel a pressure to do an impression of someone else. Because mm. in my experience, we communicate with the greatest confidence when the words we're using feel comfortable for us. But it's interesting, isn't it? Authenticity has become such a thing. Um, it's a thing in politics now. You talk about politicians being authentic. Uh, that I'm not sure we know what we mean by it, particularly. Uh, it might mean we, we trust someone and we say, we say they're authentic. But I mean, the first time I ever did anything for Radio 4, I remember the producer kept stopping me every 30 seconds saying, you're so bloody Radio 5, this is Radio 4. And actually, I think that distinction has basically disappeared now. I'm not sure we, anyone would say that to you now. No. I mean, so we, it's changed, doesn't it? That there's a lot more emphasis placed on just sounding as yeah. you are. Yes. You know, it doesn't that. change the onus of if you're contributing to a radio program or giving a presentation at work or giving a speech or whatever it might. There's still, if you're trying to communicate, you still need to communicate effectively. You still yeah. need to 
get across whatever it is you want to say in a way that the people you're talking to can understand, and there's an onus on you to, to make what you're saying comprehensible. All I'm saying is that you don't need to trade in who you are to do that. And one of the strange things I learned as I became a presenter on the radio and then on the TV is that actually one of the things that a lot of us are trying to do as TV, as broadcasters, is trying to get back to being normal in a highly abnormal situation. Yeah in that once you step into the studio and there are the lights and the microphones and the cameras and all the production around you, it's a highly abnormal situation. And I found when I was starting out that even though I was making all these resolutions in my head to be myself and this, that, and the other, I found myself doing impressions of what I thought someone on the TV or radio should do. Yeah. And it took me a while to have the confidence to say, even though I'm in this really unusual situation, actually it's okay for me to talk as I would. So there's a confidence issue there, but I think if you can have the confidence to, to do that, you're much more likely to communicate in an authentic way. Because if you'd heard me presenting in the early days, there would have been nothing unprofessional about it, but you'd have heard a young man essentially doing an impression of what he thought a news presenter should be. Interesting. And just on that theme of explanation, where, where did the inspiration come to you for the explainer videos for which you've become so famous now? They date back to 2019. So I, I'd come up with uh, Outside Source in the 2010s, early 2010s, and I'd really, uh, we'd come with up with- touch the touchscreen. Yeah, with the touchscreen. And we'd come up with, uh, we had two goals when we created the program. One was to try and reimagine what a TV news bulletin could be. Mm. And one was to create a TV format that could generate digital content, which could generate clips that would do well on social media, on YouTube, and so on. And in, the tw in 2019, in part prompted by an excellent boss I had at the time who asked me to kind of reflect on, not in a nasty way, just said like, what are we gonna do next with the program? I sat down and I thought, I've gotta be honest with myself here. I think by most measures, the first goal I've, we've achieved, that this is a program that's different to regular TV news, it's got a good slot in the schedule, it's popular, you know, we can always do more, but largely I'd say great. The second thing, not at all. Our clips were really not performing well, and, and you couldn't get away from that. By the way, they weren't necessarily doing any worse than a lot of clips and lots of other TV news programs, but that wasn't really my goal. My goal was to, to do this well, and I wasn't doing it well. And so I thought, well, why aren't I doing it well? And I looked around, and a lot of the people making hay in the digital video arena were bringing very strong opinions. Yeah. You could see this, like, you know, it doesn't matter what particular perspective, strong opinion was driving heavy consumption yeah. of video. And I thought, well, hold on, this is a, this is a problem for me. How am I gonna compete in an arena which is being dominated by opinion journalism when I can't, and I don't want to, Cut share things. my opinions? Yeah. And to cut a long story short, I spent a few months researching and thinking about what could I do as a response, and I decided to create a format that did two or three things. One that was a, the antithesis of all of that, that was very calm, very consistent, entirely fact-based, devoid of emotion, devoid of opinion. Uh, the second was, I felt, I had a hunch that people were feeling overwhelmed with information around the most important stories, so I thought, if I could create a format where I go, if you just give me five minutes of your time, I'm gonna give you a shortcut to a lot of the stuff that will help you understand this story. I had a feeling that could be, um, that could be popular as well. And so, and I also, lastly, primarily driven by Donald Trump initially, Trump and the number of things he said which weren't true forced journalists in the US, UK, and lots of other media to change the language that they used to describe things that were mm -hmm. true and weren't true. And I wanted to experiment further with that and use very direct, not judgmental, but direct language around what was true and not true for lots of stories, it became known as assertive impartiality. And so those three things, one being the man who is gonna be just giving you the facts with no demonstrative presentation at all. Mm -hmm. Second, uh, giving you all of the information I thought that would be useful on a story that perhaps you wanted some help with. And three, I was gonna write scripts that were really pretty direct about what was true and what wasn't true. And I thought, let's do an experiment with those things and see if it could work. And we ditched the touchscreen because the touchscreen didn't look good on mobile and we replaced it with bigger graphics that you could see on mobile. And we did those four things, and I was, you know, it was a calculated bet that that could do well digitally, and then it kind of took on a life of its own.
No, it certainly did. And uh, do you have a system for deciding what to do? With ex is it headline driven what you do your explainers on? Or? It's definitely a mixture of science and art, perhaps more art. I think the, 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 the phrase I use to describe what we're trying to do is fast turnaround depth. So I'm trying to give you depth on a story, mm -hmm. but I'm trying to give it to you at the point where you have maximum interest in the story, which is often just after it's happened. So we're not trying to make features where we arrive on an issue that's of general interest and we're gonna put it on YouTube and there you go. Nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. I wanted to say, okay, as this story is, something has happened which is now driving a huge amount of interest in this story right now, we're gonna arrive and give you not just the latest, but all of that context and background and fact checking and explanation. And so when we decide to move on things, we move very fast and we'll work long days to get these videos together so that we can deliver them at the point where people, we hope, are thinking, I'd quite like some more information on this. And so that's often our main calculation is, is there a story in which their interest is peaking where we can add something that, that adds to the already excellent immediate reporting mm -hmm. that we'll be doing on it? Um, we can look at a lot of data in terms of how our audiences are consuming our stories online. We can see what questions people are asking about the news, so that can be, uh, that can sometimes guide us. Uh, I remember a couple of years ago, our team at YouTube saw that there was particularly high levels of search on the Egypt-Ethiopia dam <coughs> story, which some of you may know on the Nile, and it wasn't really hitting the main headlines for the BBC or lots of others, but there's consistently high search around it. So we made a, an explainer video on that, which did very well because we'd spotted that there was a, an appetite for something in more right. detail around that. Um, so it's kind of, you know, there's a few different things, or like today I've just done a, a, a short explainer for the six o'clock news, and that came because the editor of the six and 10 o'clock news uh, contacted us and said, you know, I think we'd be interested in you doing a, doing a piece that looks at a particular angle on this story, could you? And of course we said yes, and so sometimes we'll get asked to do it, sometimes we'll think that we want to take on an issue. I mean, just in terms of research, we've got a question on the slide here, which is <coughs> how many person hours are we talking to research an episode of open source? I mean, how big is the team and how long do they work on each program? So the, so the program, which stopped in April, but when we had it, we would have four or five producers working across the, the 90 minute broadcast. If you're asking about one of the subject specific videos, which is what I'm spending my time on at the moment, it's slightly how long is a piece of string because sometimes it'll be two minutes, sometimes it'll be 10. But let's say it's one of our, uh, a lot of our videos land in the kind of four to six minute mm -hmm. area. Um, they would probably take me and I've got, I work with a number of producers, but there's two, Michael and Mary, who I've worked with for a long time on these. And if it were the three of us on a four to six minute one, that would probably be all three of us all flat out for two days to, so six, six long shifts. So, right. so, you know, quite, quite a lot. And I would also emphasize that we don't, we don't work in isolation and that we obviously connect with the different parts of BBC News, which are uh, specialist in that particular area. So there'll be a lot of input from other parts of the BBC, depending on the subject. Just to cheer you up, there's someone else on Slido who says you should get paid the same as Gary Lineker. So you're doing all right. Well, that's very kind. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, can you, can you predict which videos will go viral? I mean, yeah, with quite. our stuff, sometimes I'm, I, I just think, wow, that did well, why? Uh, do you have a sense when you do things, actually, this is gonna be a good one? Yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we're I'm Is that topicality? So it's part, it's driven by a few things. It's driven by um, just simply the, the scale of interest in the story. Yeah. That will, that's one thing. Second is, what have we got to say? So. If we're doing a pure explainer where I was simply going, this event has happened, this organization's involved, this country's involved, those tend not to do <coughs> such not good numbers on Twitter because it's less us wading into an area where there's a lot of disagreement and saying, <coughs> that's the case, that's not the case. Also, I should say some videos, sorry, I've got to talk about that. <coughs> some videos do very well on YouTube and don't on Twitter, and some do on Twitter and don't on YouTube, so I can, but yes, we can predict pretty well. I'll okay. let you talk while I drink some water. You have a drink. <coughs> now, I mean, the, the sort of, just sort of zooming out a little bit, 
Uh, <coughs> you all right? Yeah, just about. <laughs> we, we live in very, very polarised times. No, actually, before I ask you that, just one final thing <coughs> on your videos. Have you ever done an explainer video and afterwards thought, I'm not sure that's quite right? No. You doubted yourself afterwards? So, I think we, sometimes we're being very assertive about what's true and yeah. what's not true, and the stakes are quite high. Yeah. And in the end, you've got to trust your work. So we don't publish anything unless we're sure that we're happy with it. Yeah. Nonetheless, even if you have done the work, if you're making some big calls, you want to get that right. And normally, if there were an error, you would find out quite quickly. So in the first hour or two, when a video is starting to do very big numbers, certainly it's you're definitely thinking, I hope this, I hope this is going to yeah. hang together. But of course, we're confident it will because we've done the work. But in terms of have we done one where there's just been a big error in it, uh, no, fortunately. But it doesn't mean that we don't take the possibility of that happening very seriously, and they go through umpteen checks uh, before they're published. Right, so is it sort of, do you work with Verified or something? Or so, I, so I work in, I'm part of the BBC Verified department, <laughs> so let me say, let's take an, um, what's an example? We did a video about South Africa's electricity uh, supply mm. issues a few months ago. So the three of us would have worked on that. Uh, there was another producer involved as well. We would have produced the script. It was sent to one of our team in Johannesburg who looked across it and checked it all. It would also have gone through our editor of BBC Verify, who would be a generalist, but a very experienced generalist, and she would also uh, check that as well. So as standard, it would go through the hands of at least five people. Right. Sometimes it will go through the hands of even more, if need be. So there are multiple checks at different levels, but, but it would always go through whoever the, what we call the, the duty editor from BBC Verify, they would always see it. So that might be the editor of the whole department, if she's available, or if she's not her deputy, or if not one of their other senior editors. But it's not a question of me and Michael and Mary going, yeah, we're happy with this, let's go. Yeah. That's not how it works at all. Like, we, we would be confident because we've done the work, but we don't just rely on that. It goes through another series of okay. checks. Interesting. So just coming back to this question of, you know, we, we are living in polarised times yeah. where actually facts are increasingly disputed. Have you... Have you noticed that in the reaction to your work? Well, I think in some ways the fact that a lot of things are being disputed has is, is contributed to the popularity of the videos because yeah. I think people like the fact here's a product which comes along and in a calm way says to you, well, you've probably heard about this or this or this. Well, this is true. Actually, that doesn't stack up and this is partially true and this is why. And so I think in some ways our, our explainers have, have been popular in because of the environment in which they're being placed. I would also say, and I don't quite know how we would measure this, that I don't think polarization is a, is a, is a new event. No. Like, I mean, I think polarization has manifested itself in lots of different ways through the centuries, and we're experiencing one that's being contributed to by technology, but I don't think it's simply the creation of, of, of social media. Um, the other thing I would say is that you, you, you know, you can get criticism from a number of different directions when you publish a report, but again, that would be something that was happening in different forms before, uh, before social media. The nice thing, well, one of the kind of affirming things with our explainers is they get shared across the political spectrum, hmm. um, and I hope that people see them for what they are, which is an effort to explain the issue or the story, and nothing more, nothing more than that. But certainly you're aware that you're placing your journalism in an incredibly febrile and robust environment when you place it in particular on social media. And the BBC has a very, very special place in the sort of media sort of landscape, doesn't it? And do you think it helps that you work for the Beeb because the Beeb is trusted more than other outlets, used more than other outlets? Yes. Does it make it a lot easier for you to be with the Beeb? And presumably different if you were making videos for GB News. I think it, I mean, of course it helps if you're working for the most trusted news brand in the world. Yeah. That's going to, needless to say, that's going to be a head start. The only counter to that, I would say, is that even though, of course, I'm hugely proud to work for the BBC and being a BBC journalist is in many different ways a head start, reputationally mm -hmm. and in terms of resources. What is interesting with the digital arena is that you create your work and then it sails off into all of these different places. And so it has to live 
on, it has to stand on its own two feet. And so if people are watching one of my videos within the context of a BBC News app or a BBC News website, well, there's a lot of things around that video which are saying to you, you can trust this. Yeah. The BBC branding, all the other great journalism, everything around it is supporting the relationship you have with the consumer. However, if my video is sailing off to some part of Twitter or YouTube or wherever it might be, or TikTok, at that point, it might be being consumed completely on its own, surrounded by a load of information that's got nothing to do with the BBC or me. And in that moment, the person consuming it may well not know me, fine. I would hope would know the BBC, but may have no relationship in particular with the BBC. Mm. And so your work needs to, needs to work on its own. And so we do a lot of work, for example, in positioning evidence. So whenever I make an assertion in my videos, you'll see me providing the evidence straight away, not like 30 seconds later or a minute later. There's a kind of one-two rhythm to them where I go, you know, I assert something, here's the evidence. I assert something, here's the evidence. And the reason I was very focused on doing that is that if people come to you and go, yeah, but how come you're saying that? The, mm. the answer is right there. And I think that helps build trust through the through the experience of consuming the video, whether you know the BBC or not. But that is not to say that doing this with the BBC isn't an advantage, it definitely is. I mean, one of my bugbears, I suppose, with the BBC was during the Brexit, whatever you call it, process. Uh, the BBC spoke a lot about balance rather than speaking about impartiality. And balance, as far as I could see, would mean if you have one person from this side, you'd have one person from that side. Uh, do you think that's the right way to approach uh, debate? I mean, it, it sometimes struck me that if we had a referendum on is the moon made of blue cheese, you would have a blue cheeser on every time you debated it on the BBC. I don't think that's fair. I think during election periods, there are laws that yep. we have to abide by in terms of who appears and who has the opportunity mm -hmm. to, to speak. But leaving those periods aside, I, when I'm making my videos, come under no pressure to say, oh, well, you need to have a quote from so-and-so because you haven't got a quote from them. Yeah. The, the, the criteria is simply, who do I need to hear from in order to properly explain this story? And sometimes that may involve people from a range of difficult, different political parties. Sometimes, sometimes it, it won't. Um, and I don't think, I mean, I'm, I think I'm going to just simply say I don't agree with you in that I think if we were covering is the moon made of blue cheese, we wouldn't have one guest saying it is and one guest saying it isn't. But so if, do, you, do you get complaints from the other side there? So I could imagine you, for instance, doing a, an explainer video on the economics of Brexit. Yes. And you talk to a mainstream economist and they will come out with a fairly predictable answer about the economics of Brexit. But there is a side of the debate that would say, actually, I dispute that. I mean, uh, uh, do, you, do you get complaints or that about not having both sides of the argument on? No, I mean, you'd be surprised how few complaints we get about our explainers. Needless okay. to say, I mean, I don't kind of keep a running total of them, and I'm not even sure all of them get passed on. But, but um, in, you know, in, often we will go into what would appear to be contentious areas, mm -hmm. and we will spend an awfully long time trying to make sure that what we're saying is factual and fair, and that we'll make sure that we have represented uh, concerns or alternative perspectives on the issue. But at the same time, if we include those alternative perspectives, we're going to place evidence next to them to help the viewer know whether that alternative perspective stands up or not. And, and I think a lot of people can see that we're doing the work and we're doing the work for the right reasons, mm. which is to help explain the issue. So in the case of Brexit and the economy, I did an explainer about yep. a year ago, which did quite big numbers. And in the middle of explaining different aspects of that particular issue, we were absolutely clear to make the point that the, econ the economy was not the only reason that people voted for Brexit. Brexit wasn't simply an economic vote. And so, you know, that's an important piece of context whenever you're considering the, the economy and Brexit, and we made sure that was, mm -hmm. that was, that was in there. Um, but in the end, of course, you're going to get some people on Twitter who take issue with you, but if you're talking about kind of major complaints, uh, not on that issue, we didn't, I don't think. I'd have to check. Um, but, but, but even... But, but the thing that I think people can see is the work that's going in. And I think if people can see you doing the work in good faith, 
then, then that helps. Okay, have you ever come un under pressure not to tackle a certain subject? No. Not even nudged a different direction? Or Honestly, the BBC has been incredibly supportive of, uh, of the explainers that I make, and the only times when I've gone, why don't we look at a story, or, and we've decided not to, has been because the editors or not my producers or whatever the examples mm -hmm. might be say, actually, I don't think this is a good one for you to do, but not because you shouldn't do it, just because maybe you haven't got that much to say, or maybe the story doesn't add up. And that's a, that editorial process, uh, that editorial process plays out okay. in, in newsrooms all around the country, you know, in, in the world. You pitch stories, and some happen and some yeah. don't happen, but no one's gone like, yeah, that is a good story, but we shouldn't touch it. No, absolutely, on the, okay. uh, absolutely not. We've got a few questions here. God, this just proves how old I am. I'm surprised about whether you use AI to help formulate explanations, and if not, whether you think about using it. It's a great question. Been having lots of meetings about AI recently to mainly understand the the BBC's approach to this. The short answer is no. So the BBC, you know, I'm not using AI in any uh, in any way to work on my explainers. The BBC has a number of work streams in process at the moment, which is talked about uh, to some degree publicly, I think, which is that. It's saying, we get this is huge, we get there's a huge amount of different dimensions to how AI is gonna affect our work, our, both our journalism and how the organization works more broadly, mm. and we need to get this right and do this in a way that's resp responsible AI is a phrase that you'll hear a lot in yep. the BBC at the moment and a lot of other places too, and there are a number of work streams going on to see, well, how might it fit in and what processes and, and so on and so forth, but uh, while that's playing out, I'm following it with interest, but I'm not using AI in any way to make okay. our explainers. I find that very reassuring. How, how, how has social media changed your world or your job? I mean, presumably over the time you've been presenting, there's been yeah. some massive changes. Yeah, it changed it a lot. I mean, it the first change it brought was uh, when the Arab Spring happened in the early 2010s, and uh, particularly initially in Tahrir Square in Cairo, mm. we were news organizations were suddenly able to find out so much more about this protest movement because of social media. Yeah. And really, the Arab Spring uh, opened up to newsrooms all around the world the, the change that social media was going to bring. And so that immediately changed the nature of the news programming that we were making and, and continues to do so because it opened up a multitude of new sources which, uh, which, which we hadn't had before. So uh, it's changed in that way. So initially, it was about where we were getting information. Suddenly all these sources opened up. But yeah. of course it also very quickly became about distribution, which was, okay, once we've made our journalism, what form does it need to go into to, to perform well on social media? And coming back to my story from 2019, some efforts were doing better than others. My effort was not going particularly well by the late 2010s, but we did something, um, we did something about it. I think also, and this is something you'll know as well as I do, I think it's changed the, the nature of politics and political journalism because yeah. a lot of the biggest stories, I mean, we saw it uh, just yesterday with the, the vote on Rwanda, that the stories are playing out in real time on social media and that what is on social media is uh, also impacting you know, how the politics is playing, the whole, there's, a, there's a loop going on there. And so it feels to me, uh, not just in Westminster, but in lots of political centers, that social media has become part of the fabric of, of political discourse and political journalism, and that is a, that's a major shift. I mean, of course, journalists and politicians have always found ways of communicating with each other, but, but social media has added a, a, a very significant added mm. dimension. Um, so it's changed, you know, it's changed a lot. And it's made the problems of misinformation and disinformation worse. Yeah, of course. Uh, I mean, in a sense, that's an opportunity for someone in, in your business, isn't it? That actually, if you can produce something that people think is trusted information in an era where people increasingly doubt what they see. Yes, and I, I, I think the, 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 the arrival of generative AI and the arrival of deep fakes means that we're all having to second to question a huge amount of the information coming at us. I mean, I've, I'm finding even now, I'll see an image being shared by someone who at kind of first glance looks like a completely legitimate source, and I'll still second guess it and go, okay, where else can I find that image, and are we sure it's written? Yeah. So, so we're all having to question everything to a degree that we didn't have to do even five years ago, and bluntly, that's quite a lot of effort. 
Mm. And so I do think that there is a, a, a gap there, an opportunity there for organizations, whether it's the BBC or lots of others, who can come along and say, we've put in the effort to help you understand what, what you can trust and what you can't trust. I think organizations which can help us all navigate this sea of information, mm. which has some useful stuff in and amongst it, but is surrounded by stuff that we can't be so sure of, I think you know, there's definitely an opportunity there. Yeah. But we shouldn't, I think, try and minimize that it has just got harder to find information that you can be really sure of. And you know, that's the, the, not a huge amount of positive to that. Mm. And you hear all sorts of story, sort of scary stories about the elections coming next year, whether it's India or the US or here, about the role that social media might play in spreading disinformation. And of course, there's the, the never ending discussion about the degree to which the platforms are responsible for dealing yeah. with this and misinformation, the degree to which they can. Uh, and there's always been this, this tussle, as long as I've been covering media, between the, whether the platforms are publishers or not, because if you're a publisher, it brings with yeah. it many, many more responsibilities. I think there's, you know, we can debate the best way of, of tackling the volume of mis and disinformation that's available online, but I think we have to be realistic that it's going to be there, that whatever is done is not going to be able to remove this issue. And as such, the responsibility, as well as, of course, being on the regulators and on the governments and on the platforms, we inevitably are going to have to carry some of the responsibility, too, yeah. of sifting through what's coming our way and deciding what we can trust and, and can't trust. And I think, you know, one of the things that uh, you know, lots of me news media organizations are looking at are the roles that we can play in helping people not just get information from us, but also have the skills to assess the information coming their way and see the value of it, by the way, see the value of sifting out what you can trust and not trust. And also for some of your colleagues about what you can and cannot say yourselves on your social media accounts is quite an issue. But there's quite a lot of interest on the slide about BBC Verify. Yes. Uh, can you just talk us through it? Because it goes all the way, it goes, you know, you've got your videos and things, but there's also a sort of fact-checking service there right. as well, isn't it? It's quite a big... It's a big thing. I think uh, when it was started, it was a department of 60 people, 60 journalists, and it was the idea of Deborah Turness, who's been CEO of BBC News since September last year, and essentially, and I don't want to, I hope I'm, I'm not inaccurately representing her, but she was looking at a range of different work that was being done across BBC News. So there were people like me doing explanation and analysis. There were disinformation specialists like Mariana Spring. Mm -hmm. uh, we had open source investigators who were, you know, looking at all of the information available in the public domain, particularly satellite images and uh, UGC, user-generated content to, to verify certain events. Uh, we had uh, fact checkers based yeah. in BBC Reality Check. There were a number of different data analysts. There were a number of different specialisms. And Deborah's idea, which I think was a great idea, was to say, look, all of these different disciplines complement each other, and they could be more than the sum of their parts if we put them in if we put them in one place, and if we then give their work greater profile in the output of BBC News. And so she's created BBC, BBC Verify, and we all now sit, not all of us in one place, but most of us have a, uh, you can't miss us really, as you walk in the BBC Newsroom, we're just right across from reception, and we have a set so we can broadcast on TV or make videos, and a lot of the journalists doing the different things I've just mentioned are there, including uh, me and my colleagues. And so that's been exciting because it's connected lots of people with specialist disciplines in a way that I hope means that we can produce information which says, okay, we've gone the extra mile on this to fact check it or to uh, say whether this event in a war happened or not or to uh, do some analysis around data which deepens our understanding of a story. And the hope is that it complements all of the other output from BBC News. Do you think that might develop into things like, I mean, I know organizations like Full Fact do this already, sort of fact checking election debates? For instance. Yeah, I don't have the exact details on what Verify is going to be doing, but, I, but I'm absolutely certain it will be central to how the BBC covers the campaign and the election night, uh, election night itself. And BBC Reality Check, which as a brand has now been retired, but BBC Reality Check was doing yeah. things of that ilk already, and all the brilliant people from Reality Check are part of BBC Verify, so we haven't, we haven't lost that. And yes, you're, you're quite right, once you get into a formal run into an election, then being able to quickly respond to what one politician or another is saying and to get 
uh, any correction out there that might be needed is valuable. I would also say the other thing I, people always often see fact checking as pointing out when something is wrong, and sometimes you need to do that, but it's actually just as important when a politician says something that's getting a lot of heat and causing a lot of controversy and debate, when actually what they've said stands up. Yeah. And you need to, it's just as important for us to come out and say, there's a lot of debate about what Joe Blogg said. Yeah, this is correct, and these are the reasons why. It's a really good question, which is, what is the most complex issue you've covered in one of your explainers? Uh, the thing that caused you most grief to explain? I, I can think of two. Uh, one is very fresh in my mind, because we've just been looking back on it from last year, because I was doing a report about COP28 today. Last year, we did a... Uh, a f around five minutes on the ambition to keep global warming to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels, and we were trying to assess whether 1.5 was gone, essentially. There were right. loads and loads of examples in recent years of very uh, senior figures from the UN, from uh, you know big, big countries, from climate campaigners, all referencing 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, and we tried to do a really detailed analysis in five minutes of whether 1.5 was actually in any way viable. So that was very complicated and took us ages. Uh, you mentioned the Brexit and the economy one. We don't need to revisit that, but that was an awful lot of work. Yeah. And um, I did a panorama earlier in the year about uh, the rates of wage growth and the rates of uh, productivity in the UK economy and to try and connect, both explain what was happening and the reasons why and explain how that connected to the experience of millions of people in the UK, and I don't know, I didn't count how many weeks that we spent working on that, but, but we had to keep coming and coming and coming at that again, because it was, you know, the complexity of the issue was matched by the importance of explaining it, and so we, but it, it was really, really hard, and in, in the, panor the panorama was, uh, a, a, an experiment, which I, I think worked, although others will have to make that judgment, where it was a panorama, but within the panorama there were three mini explainers shot in a way that nodded to the way that we normally do our explainers. So the two, three two, roughly two minute explainers on aspects of wage growth and productivity. And getting those scripts, because we knew we were going to lift them out of the program and put them right. on social media, so they needed to, coming back to my earlier point, they needed to live on their own, stand on their own two feet. And that, I mean, it was, I was really proud of where we got to, but it wasn't quick. I mean, you, you talk a little bit sort of autobiographically in the book, particularly about university making you think about how to do explanation more yeah. systematic. Do we, do we educate people well enough to communicate and explain, do you think? No. I mean, uh, one of the reasons I've written this book is that I feel like there are many, many specialisms that we get taught brilliantly within our... Uh, schooling and within university and with our within our where we work as well but do we get taught if you write an email this way the chances of you getting a response and something happening is 80 percent higher than if you write it this way or whatever the case may be do you get taught if you're doing a powerpoint to colleagues trying to persuade them of a idea or a change if you do it this way they're more likely to consume what you're saying than you know yeah. I'm not sure if I'm not sure if we do. I think we kind of learn by seeing each other and talking to each other and in an informal way. But I don't think we stop and say, here are some basics on communication. When we do these, by the way, it doesn't guarantee that anything's going to go your way, but it's just giving you a better chance. And well, I mean, I've had uh, two daughters who are 17 and 12, and they are definitely getting more input around this area than I got. So I don't want to pass, and I need to say I haven't been at university for a while, so maybe it's changing. But certainly my experience was that it wasn't that high up on the list of things to tell yeah. us about. And my experience at university was very much, here's an essay question, here's a list of books, and I'll see you next week. And that didn't seem particularly realistic. No. Uh, and so coming back to what we were saying right at the beginning, rather than just feeling overwhelmed by it, I tried to think, okay, how do I grapple with a... a, a a challenge this big which feels overwhelming and my answer was to just not try and climb the mountain in one go it was just to kind mm. of okay I'll get to base camp and then you know and, and take it step by step um, but I wish I mean as the book talks about I mean I didn't you know uh, my 20s were not a kind of necessarily a kind of 
<laughs> moment of glory after moment of glory when it comes to my uh, <laughs> comes to my career. And I think a, th a lot of things would have been easier if I had known some better basic techniques on how to mm. ask for information, get across what I was trying to do, and so on. I still think it's the case that US universities are far better than UK ones at teaching kids how to speak. Right. You know, if you talk to graduates from US universities, they can all just stand up in a seminar and talk very eloquently. Yeah, right. I mean, they might not talk much sense. I mean, it's not a question of whether they're bright or not. They just learn to... But it comes back to my point about the story from Bush House from years ago, which is that just having the information isn't enough. If you've got information yeah. that you've pulled together and that the purpose of pulling the information together was to give it to someone else or to a group of people. If you're not paying close attention to that part of the equation, you've got to ask yourself why you're doing the first part yeah. of the equation. It, it's, it's crazy, and I can think of so many examples where I see people in lots of different situations who have clearly got really important stuff to say to me or to other people, or whatever, and the thing that's falling down isn't the quality of what they have to say. The thing that's falling down is they don't think they haven't put they haven't put the time in to think about how to pass it on. And just, and just finally, before we run out of time, can you just tell us quickly about the 50-50 project? Yeah, sure. Is? The 50-50 project started as an experiment on outside source in early 2017, and it was an effort to uh, increase the representation of women in our journalism, but it was also an effort to uh, show that we could make progress, and if we could make progress, then perhaps the way that we were making progress would be helpful to other programs mm -hmm. as well. And it started as a one-month experiment in January 2017, and it uses a very si simple system of self-monitoring. So essentially you are, uh, by collecting the data, made to look at the data every day, and the calculation was that this would drive our awareness of, the, of how we were doing and, and would also tell us how we were doing because we didn't have data. And it worked much better than we could have hoped. And it started to organically grow through the BBC Newsroom. And more and more programs started to take part. And it just got bigger and bigger, much bigger than any of us ever imagined it yeah. would. And then it spread across BBC News. And then it spread out of BBC News into basically most parts of the BBC. And then it jumped outside the BBC and started getting taken on by organizations in lots of different countries. Mm. And it kind of got bigger and bigger and bigger. And turned into a much bigger thing than I could possibly run. And so the BBC took it on as one of its formal, one of the formal parts of its uh, diversity initiatives. And it, and it still is, and we're very proud of it. Um, and I'd like to think that it, that it made quite a big difference. And that does, I mean, one of the things that struck me most about the COVID inquiry, actually, is some of the discussion about the total absence of diversity at the heart of government. So whether it was about the there weren't enough women, so questions of domestic violence or the particular issues facing women during lockdown weren't discussed enough. I saw a report about one meeting where they were talking about whether we closed down sports and no one in the meeting had been to a football match. Uh, is, is the media diverse enough to do its job well, do you think? Well, I'm sure if you ask many media le senior media leaders, they would say that a lot of progress has been made, but more, yes. but more progress needs to be made. I mean, I think that yeah. is a kind of consistent message, and I think that uh, by most measures, you could argue that things have improved, yeah. but you could also definitely argue that things need to continue improving, and I think that you hear that message from lots of different senior media leaders, and I would, uh, I would definitely agree with that. I remember that, for me, the calculation was something that I felt very keenly, which is that if you're coming to work as a journalist whose mission is to report and explain and analyze the world that you're living in, the chances of you as a news organization as a whole doing that as well as you can are simply going to be better if your organization rep is representative yeah. of the country and the world that you're reporting yeah. on. It was a, it's a simple but a very powerful equation. Mm -hmm. And it's one that the BBC completely buys into, and I'm pretty sure all big news organizations buy yeah. into. Of course, it's not a simple goal to achieve, but that's not to say we shouldn't pursue it with, with great commitment. I remember being at the annual conference of the sort of news editors of one of the BBC's rivals, where there was a lot of soul searching going on about the fact that none of their senior political journalists had voted leave or supported leave, and it was a completely remain newsroom, so it's quite an interesting question, and not, not just in terms of gender, but just in terms of views and backgrounds. It is very interesting. I, mean, I think there are, there are also interesting questions about how you get that information, yeah. Yeah. or if you get that information, 
Um, but you're right, diversity comes in in a range of in a range of forms, and I think I don't want to you know, speak for all of them or indeed any of them, but I would imagine that most senior media leaders would argue oh, well. that the greater the diversity within their organizations, the stronger the organization will be. All right, we're gonna do the fun bit now. All right, quick, go on. We're gonna do our quick fire new elite round to go figure on. out if you're new elite or not. So, BBC or Netflix? That's easy, BBC. Okay. Guardian or GB News? Both. Oh, good Lord, you see you're mixing up our scheme now. USA or EU? Uh, both, oh, covered goodness. both. Okay, no more boats from now on. Certainly not a both for the next one. Prince Harry or Piers Morgan? Oh, blimey. Uh, I'll go for Piers Morgan only on the grounds that he granted... Uh, he, he, gave us an he gave us an interview on the media show, and Prince oh, Harry right. would be very welcome too. <laughs> Greg's or Pret? Pret. Shame on you. Hotel or Airbnb? Airbnb. We do a lot of Airbnbs. Tofu or sausages? Sausages. Leveling up or cutting taxes? Going to pass on that one. Very Boris Johnson of you. Bike or car? Uh, bike. EV or SUV? EV. Well, ne neither, but if, if I had to choose, EV. Okay. Beer or wine? Uh, wine. Maths or English? That's easy. English. Football or rugby? Uh, that's a good one. I think I might have changed. I think I'll go for. I mean, I, I think I would have said football a few years ago, but rugby. What? Okay. Uh, Sorry, <laughs> so that's it, it's over. Blimey. Twitter or TikTok? Twitter. Cash or contactless? Contactless. LTNs, yes or no? No comment. <laughs> <laughs> Imperial or metric? Uh, well, it depends, doesn't it? Uh, Does it? Well, in the, there was what? a great thing going around on, on Twitter a few days ago on how the British used Imperial and metric, and it very much depends on like the different things that you're doing. So if you go for a run, it's metric, but if you go for a drive, it's imperial. And well, so obviously, on. if you go for a run, it's metric because it makes you seem like you've gone further. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I would probably say if you if you ask me for a distance from here to wherever, I would answer it in miles. All right, well, this is an easy one. License fee, keep or scrap? Uh, oh, careful. Well, I think I'm going to say no comment on that. <laughs> Ros, thank you so, so thank much. Thank you very much. Really, really Sorry for dodging the questions. <laughs> and thanks to all of you for coming. And the book is for sale in the corner. Go thank you. I'll go and sign some, hopefully.